Hello, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Okay, we're continuing with the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is our big description. So let's start with what we call the Milky Way analog, or something that kind of looks like the Milky Way in the sky. This is NGC 891, a spiral galaxy that has a similar appearance to our Milky Way. So all spiral galaxies in general have a disk in a spheroid structure, and the spheroidal structure starts at the in the center by the galactic center. There's a disk bulge around it, and then there's a, a halo of globular clusters around it. And then there's a disk, and then disk is as a, an extended thin disk of stars and gas and dust, and we see the dust in there as this dark band. The gas is illuminated by the red flares that you see in the dust. Those are like Orion nebulas that are glowing because of hot young stars glowing inside of them. And the spiral arms themselves are kind of hard to see in this one simply because, well, it's being seen edge on. But we can posit there's probably something very much like a spiral arm because spiral arms are composed of stars, young stars, and gas and dust. So the spheroid is central, thick and central, and a bunch of stars with almost no gas and dust. So all the gas and dust is way out in the disk. All right. So let's look closely at the disk and the spheroid. The disk and the spheroid, which would be also called the halo, it's an extended group and it's centrally concentrated with almost no gas or dust. And looking specifically at it, when we say that, we're talking specifically about the bulge. And in the bulge, you find a lot of RR Lyrae type stars because those are heavily evolved uh, uh, stars that tend to be a bit older, meaning they would be G-type stars that were finally evolving into giants, and there'd be clusters of old, old clusters of stars, such as globular clusters, but almost no gas and dust down in the bulge. All right, but this, the halo, though, is a much, much, much lower density region of the spheroidal component of this. In fact, you don't see it in this image, but they're there. We have old, old metal poor stars, globular clusters, and then there are lyries inside those globulars which help us determine the distance of those things. But in a galaxy of this distance, it's kind of hard to use our, our lyries in order to get them. In any event, we can detect these globular clusters by looking at deep, deep, deep images that kind of overprocess the galaxy itself. All right, the disk structure itself, though, there's a thick disk of stars, and the, all spiral galaxies have this thick disk, and it's about 1,000 parsecs thick, or about 3,000 light years thick, and that's composed of stars. And that's young and old stars, and the young stars are in open clusters and loose associations, or we'll call those OB associations with young, young stars. And then the Cepheid variables are, appear in young clusters because those are massive stars that are going through their horizontal giant branch phase, which is a very short phase in their life but they're extraordinarily luminous stars that can be seen. So in any event, we see open clusters and associations of stars inside the disk. The disk structure also has a thin layer of gas and dust. Now the scale height is much shallower, shallower than that in the stars. It's about 10 times less thick, maybe only 300 light years thick or 100 parsecs, and it's embedded within the stellar disk. Now what it's composed of is mostly cold atomic hydrogen gas, and that's what we're seeing on the right. On the right-hand side, we're seeing the emission from 21 centimeter radiation, and that's the cold atomic hydrogen gas. That's what's on the right in the reddish sort of diagram. And that happens because the atom that makes up hydrogen has just got a, a, a proton, an electron, and they both have a spin. And if their spins are anti if their spins are parallel, that is a high and their spin directions are parallel, then they would be that's in a higher energy state. And the electron can randomly flip so that they're anti-parallel, and all of a sudden that loses a little bit of energy, and it goes to a lower energy configuration, and that emits a 21 centimeter radiation. That's what that glow on the red is about. But on the left-hand side, you have a lot of molecular hydrogen, which barely emits any light at all. So we trace that in the blue on the left, with um, with carbon monoxide, and this is a carbon monoxide map made by the Planck probe. And so you can see that this has a completely thinner approach than we looked at with the stars. So de gas and dust are the raw materials for star formation, and it comes from an extraordinarily thin area. But as they're formed, they kind of get shredded and puffed, and that's why you see that kind of strange cirrusy-like structure on the left-hand side. So 
One other possible Milky Way analog is NGC 7331, which is the spirally galaxy in the upper right. Not the little neighbors next to it, but what it is. But it's that spirally one left to light. Don't look at the ones down the lower left. That's Stefan's Quintet, a group of galaxies. That's very interesting too, but we'll talk about that later. So NGC 7331 is a galaxy that's very similar to our Milky Way, and it's seen nearly edge on and about 49 million light years away. And if you look at the little galaxies above, they're about 10 times smaller, so they're about 10 times further away. They are not part of the system that is this particular galaxy. So if we looked at our Milky Way close up, this is probably what we'd see with dusty material, dusty spiral arms punctuated by pink little glows of hydrogen gas clouds that are being illuminated by the stars that are around them. And there's also a certain shape that I want you to kind of look at. If you look really carefully at this thing, you'll see that the dust kind of looks to be on one side of the bluish glows. Now that's interesting. The dust appears to, if we think about it, trail the bluish glows. Now, that's interesting. So it's not that it's trailing the bluish glows. There's something else going on. But let's be that as it may, the dust itself, we're going to get to that pretty soon, but the dust itself is, uh, is the site is where stars are forming out of, and so is the bluish glow, which comes from the hot young stars that are around. And there's some pinkish type of glows, and those are young star formation regions. All right, so if we look at a Milky Way analog, we see that our sun would be going around a system that's approximately 100,000 light years across, and our sun takes about two and a quarter million years to go around the spiral galaxy that is our Milky Way. All right, so I did describe to the spherical and halo components a bit ago, but the main researcher that came out with this was Walter Bada. And Walter Bada was a German astronomer, and because he was a German immigrant in the 50, 40s and 50s, during World War II, he couldn't do anything on the war effort. So he's an astronomer. So he used the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson that, uh, that Hubble had used in order to discover the, discover the distance to M31. And he was, and he would look at when the Los Angeles lights were blacked out because they were blacked out because they thought that the Japanese would come over and bomb uh, Los Angeles and so forth. And, and so they had blackouts. And because of the citywide blackouts of Los Angeles, um, that actually allowed them to do this deep sky observation. And at the, at the end of the war, Los Angeles started getting so bright that now the 100-inch telescope, which still exists on Mount Wilson, is completely useless for, for, for tasks like this. But at the time, the blackouts allowed him to take some extraordinarily deep images, uh, deep photos of the Andromeda galaxy, of the M31. And what he found was that the disk looks blue, as we saw from the other examples. The spheroid looks kind of reddish, and it has mostly old stars. And he could easily detect individual stars. So that's what he could find with his photographic survey, just like Hubble did. But now Bottom made HR diagrams based on the blue and red colors, just like we said, the brightness in the blue minus the brightness in the red, compared to the brightness in, say, the red or the blue. It doesn't matter which one. And those HR diagrams showed that the HR diagrams of the disk were very much like open clusters. And if you took the HR diagrams of the spheroid, they're very much like globular clusters. So he thought that that led to the idea that, in general, they were completely different stellar populations. So let's go back and look at that again, because we looked at stellar lifespans a while back, but here we go again. So massive stars live short lives. So if you're a massive main sequence star, you have to be young. They live only a few million years. So if you see an O, B, or A type star, they must be fewer than 100 million years old. The O stars and the B stars are only a tens of millions of years old. But if you find low mass main sequence stars, they can be either young or old. They can have formed 10 million years ago or 10 billion years ago. Because you really can't tell. Remember, they don't change too much. So HR diagrams of star clusters, if they're young, they have blue main sequence stars. But the old clusters don't have blue main sequence stars. And by old, we mean up to billions of years. So old star clusters can be up to billions of years old but young star clusters are on the order of tens of millions or at the most 100 million years old. And so Bada took this idea and divided all the stars up in, the, in Andromeda into two different populations of stars. So we called one of them population one, and those were disk and open cluster stars, and population two were spheroid and globular cluster stars. 
and the two populations were distinguished by where they were in the galaxies, how old they were, and their chemical composition. All right, so each of those things is pretty important, so let's go through each one. Population 1 type stars are always located in the disk and in open clusters. There, the ages of the population 1s can be a mix of young and old, and their compositions are what we call metal rich. And what we mean by metals, again, is that this is this funny astronomer way of saying there's hydrogen, there's helium, and then there's metals, which is kind of funny because everything that happens with stars is just basically hydrogen and helium, and that, that tiny amount of everything else just basically provides electrons to a star and some extra mass and does some strange things down inside. But really what it does is it provides electron opacity for, for the stellar atmospheres is really what it ends up doing. But in any event, the compositions are metal rich, meaning they're pretty close to what we find in the sun. And the sun has about 70% hydrogen, about 28% helium, about 2% other stuff. And they're found, then the population one stars are found where there's lots of gas. And, and their especially young stars are in that region. So if you find population one, you're probably going to find some young stars like some O's and B's there. All right. And they have specific kinds of orbits. Uh, population one type stars orbit in the disk and they orbit in nice ordered patterns and roughly circular things around and so they kind of do the little blue arrows in, in the blue disk of this thing and so that's what we call population one. They probably have the same orbital they or, orbit roughly in the same general direction and for a given radius from the center they roughly go the same speed. So they kind of are pretty regular in that regard. And that's what we would call a semi-relaxed system or an organized system. All right, so then they divide up the second group, which is population two, and they're located in the spheroid and the bulge. And that's globular clusters and in the spheroid component, and they are extremely ancient stars, and the oldest being up to at least 10 billion years old. And their composition has almost no metals in it. In general, they're, one ten, they're at most 1% that of solar, and at the very least 10%, 10 1,000th of, of that of the sun. They have a lot more hydrogen, about 5% more, a lot less helium by comparison, and very little metals. And they're found in places where there isn't any gas and dust, where there is no star formation. So it seems like they were made and nothing else was made next to them. And they were are their only generation of their only cell. All right, so the stellar orbits for population two, population two are disordered. They're in the halo, they got lots of random orbits, they're either in the bulge, kind of mixed around, doing all sorts of crazy stuff, or they're in the halo just doing their own thing and winging around. They orbit the center of mass just like the disk stars do, but they orbit in incredibly random orbits. Some are going prograde, some are going pro with the rotation, some are going against, some go up, some go down, some are elliptical, some are circular, it's kind of random. And now if we contrast and compare the two sets of stars, we find that the, there are two populations that Bada, fa Bada found in our galaxy and in M31. In population one, they're, they're in the disk and they're primarily in open clusters. They're young and old stars. They're metal rich. And if there's blue main sequence stars, they're there. They're in ordered circular orbits around in the galactic plane. And they're present with a gas-rich environment, and there's star formation already happening with them. In population two stars, however, they're in the spheroid, they're in the halo, they're in the globular clusters, they are the oldest stars, they're extraordinarily metal poor, there's absolutely no blue main sequence stars in their group. It's mostly like uh, G, K, and M type stars, and mostly, uh, mostly K and M type stars, and they're random elliptical orbits in all sorts of directions, and they have no dust or gas in, gas in there, and they're never coincident with star formation. All right, so what this means is, is there's a chemical evolution of the entire galaxy. So what is happening is that metals form because metals, astronomy, when I'm talking astrometals, carbon for the purpose of astronomy is a metal. So I really should put that in quotes. So metals form because there's fusion inside of massive stars. So when there's fusion, you get things heavier than hydrogen and helium. And therefore, when there's supernova explosions, they enrich the interstellar medium with the metals that were produced down in the core. And the next generation of stars form 
with this new gas that's been has all sorts of stuff in it like iron and carbon and oxygen and magnesium and neon all sorts of other things phosphorus you name it so every successive generation of stars becomes more and more and more enriched with heavier elements which we call metals so population two stars are an older generation to older generation of stars compared to population one they were around and they haven't changed uh, since since then so really what we have is that this is an interesting little diagram that was created by the Chandra X-ray Observatory team and you can think uh, that stars begin on the left hand side out of clouds of gas and dust they make protostars they make stars they end their lives in either supernovas or planetary nebulae or explode and the material that has on the right hand side goes out into the interstellar medium and you could actually think of it as the right hand side of this image then loops around to the left hand side and more protostars are made and so on and so on and so on. But if you have really, really, really young, uh, really, really uh, small mass stars, like the brown dwarfs and red dwarfs, and things less massive than the sun, then they're not going to participate in this because they don't participate or they're not part of this entire thing. So if they're in a region where there's no gas and no dust and no star formation, then you won't see their buddies or their companions or stars near them getting enriched by the material around them. Now, this asks the question. Can a star change its spots? Can a leopard change its spots? So the galaxy as a whole evolves with time, but the chemical evolution affects only populations, broad populations of stars. That's because since fusion occurs deep inside the star, down in the core of the star, and only the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen type elements ever get to the surface because of churning through convection zones, the surface composition essentially of a star. The surface composition of the star basically remains unchanged over the star's entire life. Now since there is some convective churning that can that can cause some issues that are that are best dealt with like in a research level, but for our purposes what we can really say is that the surface composition is essentially unchanged over the star's entire life. You, you know there's a lot of of course things that are current areas of research that should go against that, but but for an introductory purpose, it's more important to think how we divide things up in simple blocks, then we'll come back at it later if you decide to be a researcher. And once the star forms, therefore, the chemical composition that you have is pretty much fixed for its entire life. So the surface, uh, the surface composition that you see on the star gives you a clue about how the star was formed. So if you find that a star has almost no metal population, metals in its atmosphere, it probably is a much older generation of stars. And that is borne out by the fact that the chemical composition is different for the spheroid and halo components as opposed to the disk components. And they're completely, completely different that way. So in that regard, we've got all sorts of interesting review questions for you to talk about and think about. And what's really I would like to think is that remember that these two groups of stars are really quite divided between, their, between what they have, uh, what their chemical composition are, and what their location, and where they're found. So that's the most important thing that we're looking at here is that population one and population two stars are radically different uh, star groups. They have different origins, and they've been through the cycle. All right, so have a chance, take a look at these questions, and we'll see you next time.